Hi. Um, thanks for having me here. Uh, I'm talking today about the future of science. Why exactly I'm talking about science? You know, if you watch Hollywood movies, you always have, for example, out, uh, Outbreak or Independence Day. We're always losing, but at the end, there's like one smart scientist who's solving one problem, and then we win. Unfortunately, those movies are not just fiction. We have a lot of challenges in this world where we need smart scientists to work together. As just recently, as you know, the Ebola crisis or food crisis, sea level rise, I could continue for quite a while and tell you so many things we need to work on in science. But the question I'm asking or I would like to discuss in my talk is, is science ready to face those challenges? I'm going to tell you today, um, or I'm discussing if my opinion is that it is ready or not. As you know, I, I founded ResearchGate. Um, I studied medicine and computer science. I will talk about it a little bit later. And I always, like 10 years ago, I was sitting in a lecture room and listening to professors and thought, man, these lectures are so boring. How can you make like, a lecture more exciting? And I told my friend, one day I will give presentations, and when I give presentations, they will be super exciting. So I hope it will be today super exciting. You're laughing, that's good, it's a good sign. Um, the second thing, um, what I choose today to, the style how I'm presenting, I'm not good in reading books, because I think like, oh, it's pretty boring if you're reading like a long book. I like science books, scientific books. But if I'm reading like a story, I really get pretty quick bored. But just recently, I discovered autobiographies as a pretty good way of reading a story, understanding the story, and learning out of the example. So I'm using the story of ResearchGate to demonstrate you the challenges of which is science facing in the next years. The first I would like to talk about is technology. It's a pretty broad term and has different meanings if you're going to different directions. Um, I would like to start when I got in touch with technology. This is my first 386 SX16, my first computer. I remember going to my friend's house and then w I wanted a computer and I went back to my parents and said, hey, I want a computer. My parents told me, no, you don't get a computer, this is a waste of time. Okay? Is there a way through a challenge that I get a computer? My parents said, yes, if you have six A's in, a report, in your report card, you get a computer. Okay, challenge accepted. I got six A's. I got this computer. The guy who sold that computer works now also in my company, just as a side note. Um, <laughs> he's mid-40s now. Yeah? Um, and so I got that computer. I really was fascinated with this, with this machine. And then in the ninth grade, I'm not sure if you... In the ninth grade, we needed to go to a library. So we like, had a sleepover at a library. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone else have ever done that. Uh, I needed to do it with my class. And we slept on that ground in the library. Uh, it's not that, not that comfortable. And our task was to read like a book which we're interested in and present this book to our classmates. And I immediately directly went to HIV. I really was interested in how the virus is mutating so fast and going through a finite number of mutations and the immune system cannot react. I found that very fascinating, intriguing. I said, why can we not just, as the immune system has, have as many mutations as the virus has? <coughs> so I uh, uh, start sleeping, I fall asleep, and I was thinking day after, I, one day I'm going to fix this. Um, now I'm here, I haven't fixed it yet. I also haven't won a Nobel Prize yet, which I really wanted to do. But I hope uh, with the stuff I'm doing, I can um, enable someone else to do it. So after school, I decided to study medicine and uh, computer science, and this went directly for my doctor thesis into the virology. So I decided to, to work on viruses. The guy on the left, yeah, it's not me because that's 10 years before, so I lost, as you see, all my hairs. Yeah? Um, during the presentation, I'm going to lose more and more hair, and on every picture, I'm the guy in the middle. Um, 
So the, the guy on the right hand side is pretty important for the story of ResearchGate. He's another co-founder. I met him um, when I was a tutor for New Anatomy and I told him how the brain works and I cut the brain in front of him. And he decided later on at, um, also to do his PhD thesis in the, in the same department. So I was working on these viruses here. That's a group of viruses was cause, causing a broad spectrum of different diseases. When I started my PhD thesis, there was no system available how you can type those viruses. So for example, patient comes, patient is sick, and you assume he has this virus, this adenovirus, but you don't know which. So my task in my PhD thesis was, hey, to build a system which you can use in order to tell exactly the doctor which virus this patient has. If you would solve the problem very easily, you would just sequence the whole virus. Let me just get, let's encode the whole DNA of the virus, then you know which virus you have. Unfortunately, 10 years ago, the machines were not ready, and it was also super expensive, so you needed like a very small piece of the virus, like a fingerprint, which you sequence, use this, and then you know which virus the patient has. And I decided for one area, it's in the, right in the middle of the genome, and the size of this small piece is a 60th of the whole genome. So I developed this system, and my system took like three days for 600, like for a 60th of the whole genome. And I recently visited again the lab, and now with the new sequencing techniques, for the whole virus, you need 30 minutes. So the mass amount of data you can produce now is amazing. And if you put at the same this year, how much do you spend for whole genome sequencing, in this case a human genome, you see also the cost significantly drop for a whole genome. <laughs> Ten years ago, you needed like to invest three million US dollars, now it's a thousand bucks. It's crazy. And these two things combined gets you to the next interesting challenge we have in science, is sharing. How much information are we sharing while we're doing research? Back to my story, I was finishing my PhD thesis, writing up a paper, getting all the data together, submitting this article, and the article were like two parts. One was the system I developed, and the other one was the clinical proof that the system works. I submitted it to the journal with my professor. They came back to me and said, yeah, I like, we like your paper, but please cut out the clinical data. We are a basic science journal. Um, we don't need this. I thought about it for five seconds, but I was, ah, doesn't matter, yeah, good idea, we're getting accepted, let's just cut it out. Um, then we revising the article, why are we revising? Another group in Canada is publishing an article which exactly was doing what we were doing. So we, again, we need to revise, do more research, enrich the publication, resubmitted, article was accepted. Three things you can get out of this. First of, first of all, data needed to be stripped out, out of the publication which I found, which you think about, it's crazy, right? Like you have created data and you have proven a system, but people don't want this. Hmm. So you need to take it out. Second is the delay of the publication. And third, which is even more crazy, is the fact that there's another group somewhere in the world working exactly on the same thing I was working on. So the time and the money we are wasting here is absolutely crazy. And I was thinking about where is this coming from, right? Why are scientists so isolated, not talking to each other. So I looked a little bit into the history, and I was thinking, yeah, if you go back as a scientist, you are not like really, you couldn't talk about everything, right? Church or other religions are telling you what the truth is. So if you come out with your new findings, it could be dangerous. This is one part of the explanation you could give. Another part, of course, is the fame. A good example is HIV. A person we interviewed a couple of months ago, a very a pretty person who was really involved in the HIV discovery said HIV would have been discovered much way earlier if he would have shared the samples of the patients with everyone. But everyone wanted to have the fame, which again, ego is good because ego drives competition and creates value, but sometimes too much is exactly the problem what we have in science. Back to my story, and I'm, again, I'm losing now more and more hair. I decided to switch research areas. So I switched from finishing, I finished my virology PhD and said to myself, I want to do a new area. So I was working then 
in radiology imaging, computer science related stuff. Went to Boston, was doing it there, and then in this team, we worked on a project where we tissue engineered a finger on the back of a mouse. Yeah, E, yeah. Um, so it's a group of people of different uh, scientists from different disciplines, from molecular biology, tissue engineering, radiology, surgery, all these people needed to work together in order to make that happen. I learned a lot while I was part of this project. Interestingly, I was thinking how much information are being lost because we are not talking enough among the different disciplines. And this problem is not just in life sciences, it's just like within disciplines, but also between disciplines that we are not communicating enough. And I think this is a really big problem. Therefore, in 2008, I had the idea to say, hey, why is there not a social network for science which is exactly solving this problem where we talk more? It's pretty obvious if you think about that the World Wide Web was originally developed for scientists, right? Now you can buy shoes online, but science has been the same for the last 10 years. So I decided then with my two friends and collaborators, um, Horst uh, on the left and Zer on the right, to start ResearchGate. Um, now, and I think that's the best number to show you how scientists are sharing their information within our network, the number of papers within the first 50 months when we started were like 2 million being uploaded into the profiles of scientists. Now every three weeks, 2 million publications being uploaded. So it shows that scientists start embracing the way I think scientists should share scientific information publicly. The last challenge I would like to talk about, which is connected to this, of course, is funding. Funding, and I have seen funding in science and funding in startups. In startups, it's much more, let's say, efficient, right? Um, in science, you, you know, the professor gets the money, he distributes the money in the department, and in, in startups, you're just doing it differently. Why should we talk about this? Because there's like $1.8 trillion being moved around in science every year. So if we, should, if we become a little bit smarter in how, who we are we giving the money, it should, be, it should have a big impact. Back to my story again. So I decided working as a doctor and noticing that, okay, working as a medical doctor and working on ResearchGate is just impossible to do parallel. I need, a need, I need more time. So I decided to go to my professor, the head of the department. I asked him, Professor Manz, um, I would like to have a 50% position. The other 50% I would like to work on ResearchGate. And he said to me, I think a lot of Germans are here, um, so I can use one word uh, in German. So he said to me, Iad, you are 27, you're almost professor. Get this Furlefanz, get this Birchett out of your head. Scientists aren't social, you're not going to change this. So I, um, exactly, I, I was not really laughing at this moment. Yeah? I was a little bit nervous, but I thought about it for a couple of seconds, and then I decided to quit. Yeah, um, I called then my professor in Harvard, and he was totally different. He said, yes, come over here. I invest a little bit of money into your startup. I give you a position in my lab, and you can start working on it. The funny thing is how funding works in startups is totally different than in science. So you, funding means two things. One is you help someone, you give him money, but also let him work on his stuff and give him the freedom to work on things which are maybe not are totally connected which was in this case, but not connected to that what the person should do. So when I start also getting money from these uh, famous people uh, you may have seen before, it just works different. They look at the team, they look at what you have produced, but they also look at the impact. Right? And in science, the currency is different. Right? So in science, it is at the end where you publish. In which magazine do you publish? So it puts a lot of pressure on the scientists to get something published. But this is the wrong incentive, of course. Then articles being published just in order to be published, and you try to publish in very high journals. Perfect example is a study which is, was published beginning of 2014, which you see here, which was a 
or which was announced as a big, big breakthrough in stem cell research. At the end, weeks later, the study was debunked as scam on ResearchGate. So people published then on ResearchGate results and said, hey, I cannot reproduce those results. And at the end, um, everything what was in the article basically was made up. And you see that this is a problem. We need transparency and we need an interactive system in order to really give the, uh, the power back to the scientists who are really working on it. And again, we worked also a parallel on our own score system. This is just one number which reflects the quality of the contribution you're making in, in our system. Um, and this has been being accepted in the last years. Ironically, there was an article published about this score within, an, uh, within an, a traditional journal. End of the story is that I, and I think that's important because this is, shows that people can change and systems can change in a very short period of time. A lot of people have said that science won't, won't change. It hasn't changed the last hundreds of years. Why should you change it now? A couple of years later, my uh, Professor Furlefanz or Professor Burchett um, joined ResearchGate, and I didn't believe when I saw his name on the screen, we have like a big screen where you see all the names signing up to the service. I was looking at the names, I said, Michael Mance is signing up, no, this cannot be. So we checked the email address, it was his email address, so it was him, um, and he became a very active user of ResearchGate. Um, he uploaded all his thousands of publications, he has like 2,100 publications, um, and months later, he approached me and said, hey, yeah, I would like to invite you to talk at a cancer conference, a big can cancer conference about the success of ResearchGate. Of course, I, I went there and um, we talked about ResearchGate and he said he presented also then the success of it. He said, hey, Iad went through walls because he believed in his idea and we need more of this. And he, with his 65 years, he was 65, 65 years old, really now became an active user. So again, a good demonstration that you can change something, you can change something if you want. To summarize, the three challenges are technology sharing and funding, and the answer which the science world has given in the last years to all these challenges is open science. Just be open. And we also, with ResearchGate, have been a tremendous part of this, changing the mindset of scientists to share more of their data. Interestingly, I think open science is just part of the answer and it's just the start of the solution. Let me explain you why. This guy, who knows this guy? See? Um, he's the last polymath, like the last person who basically knew everything what was known at that time. Um, this was around in the 18th century, Thomas Young. And he knew like 11 languages. He was a physician as well, did research in many different areas. Just imagine he has all the information which you need in one brain. Of course, you can deduce out of that much easier new findings. I recently visited the lab of my professor, and I saw this, which hasn't changed that much in the last years. You know? the, the way the technology, of course, changed, they have different machines, you know? they also share more, but interestingly, the scientists don't know yet how to handle big data. Right? And I find this very fascinating. If you think about that, these labs <coughs> potentially won't exist anymore at one point. If you look at a startup, which a friend of mine <coughs> co-founded in San Francisco, Emerald Lab, who are building a fully automated lab in a, in a very controlled environment, where you really, as a scientist, you don't need any more lab. So if you look at this, of course, automatically, the next thing you, would, you are thinking about <coughs> is this, right? The data we're producing will just grow exponentially. And it's already growing exponentially. You know, the, the problem, or let's say, open science itself becomes a challenge. Just sharing everything is just part of the, of the success. We need something different. We need, basically, a Thomas Young as an AI. Right? Someone who is assisting us while we are doing research and try to understand what I'm working on, 
what data I should check out, which articles I should screen, what are raw data maybe available which I can look at. And that's something I call auto science. And I think this next has to be the next step of open science. And I think, and I'm very convinced, if we're getting auto science work, then we can solve the challenges we as humans are facing on Earth and beyond. Thank you. <laughs>